I often get questions online and during my consultations about whether or not H. pylori is an important consideration. So first, let's put this into context. This question is usually not being posed by someone with gastric cancer or an active gastric or duodenal ulcer. The people with whom I work, or for most of my people who find my videos, virtually all have gastrointestinal issues probably some type of brain inflammation, which we can call anxiety, depression, Parkinson's, etc. perhaps metabolic concerns, and often suffer from immune dysregulation with one or more autoimmune diseases and food sensitivities. Therefore, my answer to these people is, no, I don't care that your endoscopy results or microbiome analysis shows positivity for H. pylori. Now, let's dive into where my perspective is coming from. First, let's set the stage. H. pylori has been with us for at least 60,000 years. H. pylori colonizes the mucous layer of the gastric epithelium, where it has evolved mechanisms to survive the acidic environment. And depending on the source, it's in about 50 to 60 plus percent of us. And for those 50 to 60 plus percent of us who acquire H. pylori, we usually do it in childhood, where we'll carry it for life, although a small percentage of us will clear it. With that being said, only one to two percent of H. pylori infected individuals develop gastric cancer. So, should we globally prescribe antibiotics to more than half of the planet in an attempt to reduce rates of gastric and duodenal cancer? That would be insane. If you follow my videos, you know my stance on the overuse of antibiotics. I routinely work with people who have been on up to 100 plus rounds in their lives. I don't care who you are, that's excessive. So let's take a look at a few papers on this theme. These researchers in a high-risk region of China attempted to do the very thing we just highlighted, treat proactively. Here, 1,630 healthy carriers of H. pylori were given antibiotic H. pylori eradication treatment, or placebo, and were followed for 7.5 years. They found that there was no statistical difference and gastric cancer between the two groups. And this blanket treatment of antibiotics doesn't come without cost. I'm always talking about the dysbiosis it causes, which has numerous ramifications throughout the body. If we stay on the theme of cancer, these authors state, quote, the preponderance of evidence derived from information reported over the last 10 years confirms that antibiotic exposure tends to increase cancer risk and unfortunately, that it reduces the efficacy of various forms of cancer therapy. They highlight how the highest risk was associated with the use of lactams, cephalosporins, and fluoroquinolones. But these authors here place more blame on penicillins, cephalosporins, and macrolids, as you can see in the chart in dark green. In my work, it seems just about every antibiotic is going to do harm to the microbiome. See my video on antibiotics. These authors go on to state, quote, since antibiotics has no known direct carcinogenic effect, our main hypothesis focus on the antibiotics influence on the composition of the human microbiota. If we stay in the theme of cancer, a number of studies have shown an H. pylori infection to be protective of esophageal cancer. Although gastric cancer causes more deaths, esophageal cancer is not too far behind as the sixth most common cause of cancer-related mortality worldwide. This mechanism is debated. One line of thinking is, as the H. pylori reduces acidity in the stomach, there is less GERD to stimulate bad cellular behavior in the esophagus. However, this is at odds with studies that show most people who suffer from GERD actually have low HCL and probably have dysbiosis of the stomach. Sticking on the themes of cancer, we have this paper here. We see from over 80,000 Swedish subjects followed for more than four years that H. pylori eradication was associated with an elevated risk for colorectal cancer. Now, this could easily be due to the antibiotics going on to alter the microbiome of the colon, driving dysbiosis, inflammation, and ultimately cells doing things that they should not be doing. And if we look at IBD, we see a protective effect here as well, 
via a different proposed mechanism. In this meta-analysis of 23 studies with 5,903 subjects, they found that H. pylori infection had a protective benefit against the development of IBD, that's inflammatory bowel disease. The mechanism proposed by them, and many others by the way, is that H. pylori has been associated with increased gastric mucosal expression of T regulatory cells and has shown the ability to skew the host immunologic tone away from the inflammatory Th1, Th17 response. I talk about this aspect a lot when it comes to autoimmune disease and food intolerance. We want a more tolerant immune system, not one that is always looking for a fight. They also go on to state that there has been a steady rise in the incidence of IBD in H. pylori endemic regions that corresponds to the beginning of anti-H. pylori therapy, i.e. antibiotics, for peptic ulcer disease. And even when it comes to the severity of Crohn's disease, which is one half of the IBD equation, H. pylori infection is associated with less fistulas and strictures. Now, am I saying that we should intentionally take H. pylori in some individuals, kind of like a probiotic? Of course not. That would also be insane. The goal here is to understand the overall picture. And by the way, there are much better ways to modulate the immune system. I hope you're enjoying the video so far. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and recommend to friends and family. Also, if you're feeling extra generous, hit the super thanks below. And in this huge study, these authors found that treatment for H. pylori infection is associated with a significant increase in the risk for autoimmune disease, including IBD. Their rationale for this study comes from their statement that says, quote, there is growing evidence that H. pylori is a protective factor against chronic immune-mediated disorders such as asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, and inflammatory bowel disease. Now, one clear factor here is, yet again, antibiotics altering the microbiome and driving IBD. See my video on IBD. Another, which they highlight even more, is the regulatory T-cell theory we highlighted earlier. It appears part of H. pylori's gift to survival is not only the ability to survive in a high acid environment, but also to dampen the host immune response. And this regulatory T cell benefit could be systemic, dampening inflammation in distal organs. Now we have to consider that this theoretical benefit is for the majority of us who carry H. pylori, but have no symptoms, the healthy carriers, so to speak. Their conclusion is a logical one, which is, quote, our data support the current practice of checking H. pylori only in symptomatic patients as H. pylori treatment is associated with an increased risk of autoimmune disease, including IBD, particular in H. pylori endemic regions. So let's talk about those symptomatic patients. Depending on the reference, gastric cancer is the number two, three, or fourth cause of cancer deaths globally. That's nothing to sneeze at. H. pylori causes 36% and 47% of all gastric cancers in developed and developing countries, respectively. Furthermore, H. pylori infection is widely accepted as the most important factor in the pathogenesis of duodenal ulcers. In fact, 10 to 15% of the infected individuals will go on to develop gastroduodenal ulcers. Additionally, meta-analysis studies have shown superior ulcer remission rate for both gastric and duodenal ulcer in patients successfully eradicated of H. pylori infection. Treatment of those with symptoms with antibiotics reduces the risk of gastric cancer. So with all that said, I'm not questioning the connection between H. pylori and the sequence of inflammatory events which could set the stage for cancer. What I'm saying is, let's put this into perspective. People with a history of peptic ulcer disease, active gastric ulcer or active duodenal ulcer associated with H. pylori infection should be treated. But if 10 to 15% of the infected individuals will go on to develop gastroduodenal ulcers, with 2% of them developing gastric cancer, what about the roughly 90% of the rest of those who are positive? According to the authors in this video, they should not be treated, and that seems logical to me. 
there is more to the picture which is not fully understood. For example, there are strains of H. pylori which increase risk. Or how about NSAIDs? H. pylori infection increases the risk of peptic ulcer bleeding by 1.79-fold. Okay, but NSAIDs increase that risk by 4.86-fold, far higher. And when the two are present, that risk goes to 6.13-fold. Are we taking NSAIDs into consideration? Or how about the data on PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, which shows a significant association with gastric cancer? PPIs reduce HCL. So does H. pylori. So perhaps the combination allows for dramatic changes in the gastric microbiome, which we can see here in Table 2. The gastric cancer microbiome is different than healthy controls, and here we see lots of lactobacillus. So some percent of this lactobacillus and these other bugs are coming from the oral and nasal microbiome. So we have bacteria who normally reside in one location, but due to alterations are able to survive in another where they can be more pathogenic than normally so. Kind of like the introduction of a foreign species into a new ecosystem. Or like my video on colorectal cancer, where members of the oral microbiome take up residence in the colon to drive colorectal cancer. And here's another original research paper on the gastric microbiome not included in the previous table. They characterize the microbial composition of controls, patients with chronic gastritis, intestinal metaplasia, think precancerous, and gastric cancer, as well as their potential association with H. pylori. You can see not only differences in the colors representing the bacterial taxa, but also in the number of different types of bacteria as the gastric microbiome progresses from healthy to gastritis to precancerous to cancer. And you can see it here from a different viewpoint. Across the top, we have the same four groups. And below, we have the abundance of bacteria. As you can see in the controls, there are not only fewer families of bacteria represented, but their abundance is much less as well. So this sounds like SIBO, no? Too many bacteria and the wrong types in the wrong location. Only instead of this being the small intestine in SIBO, this is the stomach. And this information is not new, far from it. In the late 1800s, gastric cancer was the most common cause of cancer in most countries. And researchers often reported excessive colonization of bacteria and fungi in the stomachs of those with gastric cancer. For example, here is reported, quote, the presence of both lactic acid and a large amount of bacteria in the stomach. And here, quote, in all cases of carcinoma of the stomach, numerous colonies of a large variety of germs are found. They seem to revel in this superb culture bed. There are still a lot of unknowns when it comes to gastric cancer. Why was it so prevalent over 100 years ago? They weren't taking PPIs and antibiotics, and yet the theme of overcolonization of bacteria and fungi still holds true today as it did then. We know from epidemiological studies that PPIs are a risk factor for gastric cancer, and they work by reducing gastric acid, which is the first line of defense against bugs who don't belong. We know that oral antibiotics, when swallowed, will first start by killing and changing the microbiome of the stomach. And I hear far too often in my consultations that patients were given antibiotics solely because they were H. pylori positive, but with no gastric symptoms to warrant the prescription. We also know NSAIDs are a risk factor for gastric cancer as well. But when it comes to the questions I receive about H. pylori's role in someone's SIBO, autoimmune condition, intestinal health, and so forth, in all of my meta-analyses I have done over the years, never has H. pylori come up in the microbial fingerprint of a given disease or condition. It's the usual suspects, the ones I mention all the time. They determine health or disease. So my goal here is to educate you. 
My concern is that you don't take unnecessary rounds of antibiotics. To me, they are the real culprit in most disease. I'm concerned about the link between your microbiome and your health. The conventional medical community is concerned about your health and other things like not getting sued. So now you're armed with more information. It's up to you what you do with it. If you liked the video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, somewhere around here, you can go to my website where you can schedule a consultation with me. You can also view the protocols. And here, you can watch the next video.